Get your hands off of my daughter. Get your hands off of her now. We're going home. Yes, we are. Call 911 all you want. We are going home. Imagine you lost all control over something or someone and you were helpless. Imagine a world where you were treated like a criminal when all you wanted was to protect those that you loved. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Are you good? I am. Well, woo diddly who the Jenny and John episode. Wow, that brought about some some voices. That brought about some opinions. My God, people came out in force with their thoughts on it and did not hold back. I'll deal with actually a lot of that, and I think, in the next B Notes episode, because there were some extreme reactions. Okay, a couple of quick shout outs, and then on with this crazy story. The first shout out goes to the five new Patreon members who have joined Patreon this week. Hello, you sexy beasts. You have no idea how much. That helps me to keep the podcast going, so thank you. Okay, next, Candy Wu. Great name. Fantastic. Candy is in Australia, and in her message, she called me Beza, with an R on the end, which I quite enjoyed. <laughs> Couldn't help but hear it in an Australian accent. Okay, John Birch. John is from England. And he listens while driving his lorry. You are in good company, John. There should be, I think, some sort of sub-ESP group for drivers who listen. (laughs) I would love that. (laughs) So, hello, John. He says ESP is the best podcast by a mile. And I like that for two reasons. Because, you know, first of all, it's a lovely compliment. And second of all... By a mile. He's a truck driver. Get it? (laughs) Well, it made me laugh anyway. And Kristen Robertson. Happy birthday for yesterday, Kristen. Kristen's from Arkansas. (laughs) And she said, I would love to hear you say Arkansas in a Scottish accent. Well, I hope I did it justice. And I hope, Kristen, that you had a lovely birthday. Okay, on with the story. The story is bumpy. It's unbelievable. But it's as true as the sky is blue. (laughs) Don't know why I'm trying to rhyme things. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. So this story happened only two years ago. It's 2016 and we're in Sherburne, Minnesota. A city with just over 1,000 people living there. There's about 500, 600 houses. 
it's a little city. And there's plenty of farms, plenty of farmland. It's a safe, it's a welcoming community. One of the families who live there are the Gilderhus family. And they're a big family. So you've got mum, Amber, dad, Dwayne, oldest daughter, 18 years old. Her name is Alyssa. And there's five other children in the family, ranging in age from 18 months up to 11 years old. I mean, that is a busy, busy household. (laughs) Six kids. Wow. Amber and Dwayne were busy. They like to uh, get jiggy with it. (laughs) So let's go to Christmas Day. 2016. All eight members of the family are gathered in the living room and they're ready to open their Christmas gifts and enjoy all of the madness that Christmas morning brings. Now, Alyssa, the oldest child, she only wanted one thing for Christmas and that was a pair of cowboy boots. I get Alyssa on this one. I used to wear (laughs) cowboy boots (laughs) out clubbing. (laughs) What the fuck was I thinking? (laughs) What a loser. I used to wear (laughs) a black skinny t-shirt, a leather jacket, jeans and a pair of cowboy boots. (laughs) Yeehaw, ride them cowboy. Um, I obviously thought I was channeling some sort of George Michael faith (laughs) time periods when I was doing that. And if anybody um, has any, any photographic evidence of that time, I would appreciate you burning them. Thanks very much. (laughs) So what Alyssa really wants is a pair of cowboy boots. And when she opens her gift, she finds that's what she's got. They are emblazoned with an emblem of the future farmers of America. And that was her favourite group that she was a part of. So Alyssa was a really a really pretty girl. She was tall, long brown hair, very healthy, very fit. She liked to ride horses. She thought that one day what she might want to do is teach horse riding. You know, she had lots of friends, she was part of lots of clubs. So, as the parents and the other siblings are opening up their gifts on Christmas morning, Alyssa gets up and she goes to the bathroom. The family continue to open their gifts, drink hot chocolate, when they hear from the bathroom the most earth-shattering scream coming from Alyssa. The scream is followed by Alyssa shouting, Mum, Dad, I need you. Amber and Dwayne run to the bathroom and they find Alyssa curled up on the floor, vomiting all over the bathroom floor. Now when they try and lift her up, they really struggle because the whole left side of her body has become weak, she's having a really violent headache and she can't hear properly. She's slurring her speech and they don't know what the hell is going on. She'd a moment ago sat in the living room with the family, opened her gifts, she was fine. She got up, said she needs to go to the bathroom and now this is what they've found. Dwayne, her dad, will say at this moment that he looked into Alyssa's eyes and he saw fear. He saw absolute terror in her eyes because she had no idea what was happening to her body. So they call an ambulance immediately. Now, this is tricky because it's Christmas Day and it's snowing really heavily. So they have no idea how long it might take for an ambulance to arrive. However, they're in luck and the wait isn't too long. 
Alyssa is rushed to the nearest hospital, just outside of Sherburn. And when they take her to the hospital, she is immediately taken into intensive care. Doctors get to work fast and before long they can provide an answer for the family. The doctors tell Amber and Duane that Alyssa has suffered a brain aneurysm. They explain that a blood vessel inside of her head has suddenly burst. And although they can although they can diagnose it, the news isn't good for Alyssa. Doctors say to her family her life is hanging by a thread. Ugh, God. So what doctors do is to act as quickly as possible and minimise any further damage and try to increase the chances of survival. They drill a hole in Alyssa's skull to relieve the pressure from the aneurysm. But they can't guarantee to the family that this will in any way save her. The aneurysm in her brain has left Alyssa with a paralysis down her left side. Her speech is completely slurred and she'll now have to be fed through a feeding tube. This next detail of it is just so grim. Mm, It's just horrific. In order to operate on her brain, naturally, what they have to do is they have to shave Alyssa's head. And so Amber, her mother, will just remember that at one point a nurse comes out and she's holding a clear bag. And in the bag is Alyssa's hair. And as the nurse hands it to Amber, Amber bursts into tears, thinking this might be all that she's going to be left with of her daughter at this moment in time. Oh, it's just horrific. I think just the image of a bag of hair is just horrible. Right, so at this point the family are, they're concerned that perhaps Alyssa isn't in the best of hands here and it's nothing against this hospital but this is a small hospital and they feel like perhaps she might be better in a more specialised clinic so they beg doctors to send Alyssa to the Mayo Clinic the Mayo Clinic is 85 miles away from where they currently are Now, doctors, they consider this, but the problem is, Minnesota is, it's December, and it's in the midst of a terrible ice storm. And an air ambulance would really struggle to get into the hospital and get her to the Mayo Clinic. Right, just before we carry on, because this is really important, what is the Mayo Clinic? Just so you're clear, in case you're thinking you're not picking it up with my accent, I am saying Mayo, M-A-Y-O, clinic. As in, what's that? I'll have a tuna mayo sandwich for my lunch. Thanks very much. (laughs) So it is Mayo, as in we would think, the shortened version of mayonnaise. So, or I'll give it its proper name, the world famous Mayo clinic because that's all you ever read about it is that it's world famous well why 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 is it world famous the one that the family are talking about was the very first one ever to be opened in america just outside of minnesota and it's now ranked and has been for years the number one hospital in america it has over three thousand permanent staff And it spends millions upon millions every year on medical research and treatment. That's really its massive selling point, is that actually as much money goes into treatment as goes into research. So because they have this huge research facility, 
within the Mayo Clinic, it means that they can try new methods of curing things. They can try new operations. They can try lots of different things. And this makes them a leader, an absolute leader in the medical field. In the past, the Mayo Clinic, it has cured and it has treated cases which other hospitals were willing to write off. So, you know, when a patient in another hospital was told, I'm sorry, you're going to be dead within a week, the Mayo Clinic would save that person's life. It's very well regarded in the medical community. And so you can see where... Alyssa's family are coming from here. You can see why they're saying we want her to go to the Mayo Clinic and get the best treatment. But can they get her there? So they have this anxious few hours while they wait and they wait and eventually the ice storm breaks and Alyssa is transported to the Mayo Clinic by air ambulance. So when she arrives at the new hospital, Alyssa has been given a 2% 2% chance of survival. That's what the family are told. And the neurosurgeons at the Mayo Clinic, they get to work immediately. Doctors at the clinic, they assure the family that they can save Alyssa's life. And over the next month, I mean, what a horrible month it must have been, but over the next month, she receives four different operations on her brain. Ugh, four operations, my God. But the doctors and the family, they are delighted. Duane remembers a doctor saying to her, she's not supposed to be here. She has beat the odds. Her mum, Amber, will say, The male neurosurgeons, they saved her life and we will be grateful to them forever. So at the end of January, um, four weeks on from when the aneurysm happened, Alyssa is transferred from the neurology unit to the rehabilitation unit. So at this point, it's looking to Alyssa and her family Like, she's going to spend some time in rehab and then be able to go home. I can't keep saying rehab without just hearing in my head. They try to make me go to rehab. I said, no, no, no. I mean, I know that's completely not appropriate, but I just can't get it out of my head. Um, However, going to rehab is where things are going to take a much darker turn a much much darker turn for the family and for Alyssa this nightmare it should be coming to an end but a new nightmare is only just about to begin in the rehab part of the clinic the family they start to become concerned that Alyssa is in extreme pain. She's in an extreme amount of pain from the last operation and that she needs more painkillers. The doctors have decided instead they're going to take her off of painkillers. So Amber and Duane are like, why? Why are you taking her off of painkillers? This makes no sense. They are incredibly frustrated, and you can understand why. They're seeing their daughter, she's lying in a hospital bed, she's crying out in pain, and the doctors are refusing to give her any painkillers. But the more and more and more that Duane and Amber try to raise this with staff, they're treated like... They're treated like idiots. I mean, you you know the kind of thing I'm talking about. It's like... I'm sorry, you're you're not medically trained, so therefore you don't know what you're talking about. We're in charge here and we're telling you she doesn't need painkillers. To which they're saying, yeah, okay, that's true. We're not medically trained, but we know pain. We know pain 
and we know our daughter and she needs something, so can you sort it fucking out? Can you give her a painkiller? And they're like, no, no. It's very common to take away pain relief from a patient who's had brain surgery. And Dwayne will point out, actually, he's done some research. He's spoken to some other doctors in other places. He's been reading medical journals and nowhere can he find the information that says someone who's had brain surgery should not receive painkillers. Doctors don't like this. They immediately do not like this. They're not enjoying this challenge from the family. This is only the start of the problems, but this is challenge number one. Dwayne says to them, actually, see if you go on your website, if you go to the Mayo Clinic website, it says that you treat post-brain operations with painkillers. So why is Alyssa not receiving them? The hospital just stop having the conversation. Doctors just refuse to engage in that chat anymore. Don't want to hear any, any more of it. I have to say, there is nothing, and you all know this because we've all been there, there is nothing fucking worse than somebody treating you like an idiot, is there? It's just got to be the worst feeling and the most frustrating feeling in the world. You know when someone's talking to you like you're a fucking idiot and you're standing there with gritted teeth and all you want to do is like actually punch them because you're like, I'm so fucking annoyed by the fact that you're talking to me like a fool. Yeah, okay, the family don't have medical knowledge. Of course they don't, right? That shouldn't be a slight against them. I don't have fucking medical knowledge because I'm not a doctor. If you're not a doctor, you don't have the knowledge. Same as if, if you're in a car and your car breaks down. I'm not a mechanic. I wouldn't know how to fix Do you know what I mean? But you don't need to be passionising about it. You don't. You need to talk people through things. You need to explain shit to them. You can't just be like, no, no, this is what it is. We've made the decision. You have to talk people through it. You have to let them understand it. And I think that's what doctors were not doing with the family. So what it does is it actually just creates a tension between the family and the clinic. And that tension is going to develop further and further. I will just say at this point, I do have the utmost respect for doctors, for nurses, for anyone who works in the medical profession. But these doctors, hmm, not so much. So Amber and Dwayne, they have other problems. They say, Alyssa's feeding tube, it's the wrong size. Now, they can see it's the wrong size. Alyssa is telling them it doesn't feel right. So they kind of harass doctors to get it corrected. And it takes so much time for a doctor to finally go, Okay, yeah, it is the wrong size. Sorry, our mistake. We'll fix it. It's also the family who at this point discover that Alyssa has a bladder infection. They discover it. Not the world-famous Mayo Clinic doctors. So the doctors are becoming increasingly frustrated with the family. They feel like they're interfering all the time. But Dwayne and Amber, they feel like they want the doctor replaced. They have no faith in the doctor who is looking after Alyssa. They ask for a replacement. Does it happen? And no, it doesn't. So what do Amber and Dwayne do? Well, they ask for a meeting with the entire care team in charge of Alyssa. The doctor's the nurses, anyone involved. So the meeting is scheduled. They bring with them, and I love this, <laughs> they bring with them a whiteboard and it is filled with questions. So they rock up to the meeting. They've got this massive whiteboard. They've got a marker pen and they've written down all of the questions. And one by one, Amber and Wayne, they go through the questions in a meeting 
with the care team, asking, why is she not on painkillers? When will she be released? Lots and lots of questions. Now, do they leave this meeting filled with answers? Do they fuck? They leave more confused than when they went in. Amber said at this moment, we just need someone who will at least listen to us and hear us. She says staff just don't give a fuck. She later apologises for her language. I wouldn't apologise, Amber. This is eight weeks on from Christmas Day and the situation is just getting more complex. Amber also says we will take no shit from doctors at the Mayo Clinic because at this point, what do we have to lose? Well, that's a really important question to ask at this point in the story. What do they have to lose? The day after the meeting with the whiteboard, Amber arrives at the clinic ready to see her daughter and to talk with staff just to see how Alyssa is getting on. And when she arrives, she sees in front of her, right, she sees a few of Alyssa's care team in the hallway and they're with a man that she doesn't recognise. Now when the team of people see Amber approaching, they all go into a room and they shut the door. Amber, at this point, (laughs) love this woman by the way, (laughs) she listens up against the door and she can hear that they are discussing her and her family. So, what does she do? She opens the door She goes into the secret meeting and she says this. Since you're talking about my family, I think it's only appropriate that I would be here also, that I am included in the conversation. So the man who she doesn't know, he tells her to leave. He demands that she gets out. Amber says, no. He then says, I run this whole rehab unit. Do you understand me? She says he was intensely aggressive towards her. But, you know, Amber's no walkover. She says to him with a similar aggression and frustration, I need to talk to you about my daughter. Do you understand me? At that point, He simply walks away. (sighs) Amber, she leaves the room. She goes to Alyssa's bedside. And shortly after her, get this, three security guards arrive and they physically remove Amber from her daughter's bedside. What the fuck? Outside, they say to her, you are not allowed to participate in Alyssa's care anymore. You are not allowed on Mayo Clinic property. You will now be escorted off the premises and you will not return. So Amber's like, why am I being kicked out? What's happening? She doesn't get any answers from doctors. She's told by a social worker that her constant demands to see doctors Her constant demands for staff to change and her insistence upon having meetings and then interrupting meetings was the reason that she was under no circumstances to enter the Mayo Clinic ever again. Can you believe that? Can you think how angry you would be? Now, Dwayne's told that he can stay, but that he is to have no involvement in 
Alyssa's care. He's allowed to be there, he's just not allowed to interfere. Amber gets told by the hospital, you are compromising your daughter's treatment. The male, the male staff actually say to her, you're putting your daughter at further risk with your constant interruptions and your constant questions. Now it's a really confusing one because I don't really see how she's putting Alyssa's treatment in danger. I, I don't see really what she's doing. But they're saying that's what you that that's what you're doing. You're compromising her treatment, her rehabilitation. Amber says, I would never compromise her care. She's my daughter. I love her. But I just don't trust this situation. Something isn't right. Something is wrong. I know something's wrong. And all I'm doing is trying to fight to get to the bottom of it. So Amber's, I mean, she's pretty powerless at this point. You know, she's kicked out of the hospital. So she takes to social media. She goes to Facebook specifically to rage about the experience and to ask for help and advice. And she gets a massive response. And the response that comes back from strangers, people she doesn't know is, get your daughter out of there. She's in trouble. She is a prisoner of the Mayo Clinic. Hmm. Why would a hospital want to hold on to a patient? A patient in rehab whose life they had saved. Well, remember I told you that Mayo was a world famous research clinic. What Amber was beginning to discover as she was making loud noises and attracting people to the story of her daughter, was that other people had had their family members medically kidnapped by the Mayo Clinic. Medically kidnapped. This is a term I didn't even know existed. I didn't know until a few weeks ago this, these were even words. I didn't, I didn't even genuinely know that that existed. I hadn't considered that that could even be possible, and forgive me if that sounds stupid. I just didn't know that facilities kept people in for research and for testing. That kind of blew my mind. It's one of those ones where you go, do you ever get something in life where you're like, I wonder if everybody else in the world knows this thing and I'm the one person who doesn't know about it. Because once I started looking at the world of medical kidnapping, oh my God, there's a million stories of it happening. There's some really devastating, tragic, tragic cases where people have been medically kidnapped. And yeah, and then I started thinking, am I the only person who's never, ever heard of it? Anyway, uh, well, yeah, I'm sure you'll let me know if you've never heard of it. Please do. <laughs> please don't Please don't leave me out here on my own <laughs> as someone who doesn't know <laughs> what it was. <laughs> this is why we tell stories. This is why we podcast, is to learn about things. <laughs> so the family decide on a three-pronged attack on the Mayo Clinic. Firstly, Amber is whipping up a storm and she's trying to get the media involved in her daughter's story and the police. Dwayne, who is allowed into the clinic, is asking daily for Alyssa to be released, but he's getting no answers. And Alyssa herself who by now is doing quite well in her recovery, is asking nurses, doctors, when can she be released? But just being ignored. Amber's now speaking to the press and she's saying this. They refuse to let her go. No one has any say in her care. She's basically a prisoner of the Mayo Clinic. 
Dwayne, he tries to talk to a senior doctor on the rehab staff team. It was the same doctor who had told Amber to get out of the hospital. When Dwayne says, can I have Alyssa out of here and continue her rehabilitation at home, the doctor's response is, I have nothing to say to you. This is a legal problem. Oh my God. Dwayne, not satisfied with that answer, says, Can I speak to your supervisor, your boss? And the exact words that this guy speaks back is, I run this whole floor. And he turned and he walked away. I mean, this guy just sounds like a major dick. What a dickhead. So right now, this just goes up to the ridiculous level. Two female nurses are assigned to stand by Alyssa's bed every time a visitor comes to see her. And if there is a mention of leaving the clinic or a mention of her mother Amber, the two nurses will instruct the visitor to leave. This is insane. They're now policing what Alyssa can and can't talk about. Or what visitors can and can't talk about. Alyssa is, and I'm suspicious of this, I'm suspicious. She's given a psychiatric test by a Mayo Clinic doctor. And the results indicate that she isn't capable of making any of her own decisions about her medical care. And so, anything that she says about wanting to be released is to be ignored. It's just to be completely ignored because this male doctor has said, no, no, she is not capable of making any decisions for herself. Um, <laughs> Suspicion, she wrote. <clears throat> Dwayne says at this time, they have taken my daughter and there is nothing I can do about it. Something else, even fucking worse, is happening and the family don't even know about it. Get this, the clinic are seeking advice on how to get full guardianship over Alyssa and remove her from her family entirely. Insanity. Amber and Duane, they don't even know that this process is happening. <sighs> Whilst that's in motion, the hospital, they take away from Alyssa her phone, her tablet, her laptop. Why? Because they've discovered that at one point she used her tablet to make a video and send it to her mum. Hospital, no, no, that stops. That has to stop now. At this point, the hospital take it a step further and they stop all visitors from being able to see Alyssa. They are essentially, at this point, isolating her as much as they possibly can. So when the family, like aunts, cousins, you know, Uncle Bill... Auntie Jemima come to visit, they're not allowed in. They're simply told, no, no, you are impeding her care. Well, how, they ask. How exactly are we impeding her care? Well, you just are, is what they're told. That's not an answer. That's that's not a fucking answer. You just are, is not an answer. But they're not allowed in to visit. Amber's now not seen her daughter in weeks and she is beside herself. And through her Facebook campaign and through her making lots of noise as she should be and shouting really loudly, she's discovering lots and lots of cases in America where hospitals have taken guardianship over patients and they're not allowed to see their children. 
Amber and Dwayne, they're desperate. They're reaching out to everybody and they get hold of a board member for the Mayo Clinic. And they contact this guy and they say, look, staff will not talk to us. Is there any way that you can... And I love this phrasing. (laughs) They say, is there any way that you can wrap your arms around the situation and help us get our daughter back? This board member, good on him, he agrees to help. Within two weeks, that board member has resigned from the Mayo Clinic. Why? Because he says the treatment of Alyssa is disgusting. It's one of the worst practices he has ever seen. He says, I have been proud to be a part of this clinic for over 15 years. But this is the end for me. Now, it's unfortunate for the family, but his leaving, it it doesn't help. It doesn't help the situation, because now, now there's no one. Now, you're probably thinking what I thought at this point. Why in the hell are police not involved? Well, the complication there is, you can, you can phone police and you can say, I think my child, I think my relative has been medically kidnapped. And police, you know, they, they will do their best to take that seriously. But there is so much red tape. There is so much to go through for police to be able to prove that, to get through hospital systems. It's a big, messy world. A police officer cannot just rock up at a hospital and be like, oh, so we hear you might have uh, kidnapped someone. No, it's way, way more complicated than that. They need proof, they need evidence, and Amber and Duane, they present their findings to police, but it's, yeah, it's way too complicated for police to get involved. So by now they are utterly terrified and they're desperate. Amber and Duane, they decide to go online and they find a a form online that Alyssa could sign saying that she wanted to leave the hospital against medical advice. Now, yeah, I can see their thinking here. I'm sure we all can, but come on, be realistic. That's not going to work. That's not going to work at all. They know it. They know it themselves. They bin this idea. And they start to think again. They've got no idea at this moment how they're going to get Alyssa out. Two nurses are assigned to keep watch of her at all times. However, Amber and Dwayne, they start to hatch a plan to get Alyssa out of the Mayo Clinic And they decide it's going to happen the very next day. So remember that Dwayne is still allowed access to Alyssa. He is the only person who's allowed access at this point. That's actually partly to do with, and I think this is quite interesting. When everything first happened and she went to the Mayo Clinic, doctors there, they trained Dwayne in how to insert and replace Alyssa's feeding tube. They took him through that process. Don't know why that didn't happen with um, her mother, Amber. I have no idea why it didn't happen, but it happened with Dwayne, so he's now allowed to, to be around her when every other family member is banned because he's actually able to remove and replace the tubes when necessary. So the day that they decide action has to happen, Dwayne is, as usual, in Alyssa's room. In the room are the two nurses, stroke prison guards. (laughs) And he looks at the nurses and he thinks, right, okay, of the two of these, who's the slightly kinder one? I mean, neither of them are particularly nice people, 
but he thinks, who's the slightly softer of the two? And he chooses the one who's a little bit less harsh than the other. And he goes to her and he says, listen, I wonder if you could help me here. Alyssa's great-grandmother, she's in her 80s. She's had knee surgery and she doesn't really keep very well at all. However, she would love to see Alyssa for just 15 minutes, just to say hello. Do you think that would be possible? Now, as no visitors were allowed at all, they really had to think about it. And he plays, he does this very well. He plays the, she's an old, frail woman. And she just wants to see her great-granddaughter. Please. Please. He ends up begging these nurses. And they say, yes, okay. A short visit is all it can be. Right, well, that's part one of the plan. Now for part two. Dwayne says, well, here's the thing. She's very frail and there is no way that she would get up these stairs to Alyssa's room. So is it possible that I could take Alyssa down in her wheelchair to the lobby to meet her great-grandmother? Hmm, so again, the nurses stroke prison guards. They think about it and they agree. But they say Alyssa will have to be accompanied by them also. Fine, fine, says Dwayne. Great, sounds great. So Dwayne says, okay, right, well, I'm just going to make a call. I'm just going to make sure that the great-grandmother will be downstairs in half an hour and we'll go from there. So half an hour passes. Dwayne gets Alyssa into her wheelchair And he prepares to take her down to meet her great grandmother. When Dwayne, Alyssa and the two nurses arrive in the lobby, there is no 80-year-old woman. Instead, there's a nine-year-old child holding a small video camera. Nurses ask what the hell is going on. Where is she? Where's the old woman? Alyssa asks what is going on. Now it's at this point Dwayne says, Ah, her car is outside. I can see her. She's just there. And he he starts to wheel Alyssa towards the door of the clinic. And the nurses are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. What's going on here? And Dwayne says, that there is her car. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to push the wheelchair towards it. The nurses are like, this is not really what we agreed to. The whole time, the nine-year-old with the video camera is filming everything. The nurses are asking, who is this? Why has he got a video camera? Dwayne just doesn't answer the question. As Dwayne manages to get the wheelchair towards the car, the passenger seat door flies open and behind the wheel of the car is Amber. Dwayne shouts, Alyssa, honey, we are going home. He lifts Alyssa from the wheelchair, he places her in the passenger seat And it's at this point that the nurses grab Alyssa and they try and pull her back out of the car. Dwayne is screaming, get your hands off of my daughter. Dwayne closes the car door. He jumps into the back seat. The nine-year-old with the video camera jumps into the car. The nine-year-old with the camera was Alyssa's younger sibling who Dwayne had instructed to film the entire thing. He didn't want the Mayo Clinic trying to say that he'd been violent or aggressive, and so he made sure the whole fucking thing was recorded. 
The car drives away and as it drives out of the hospital car park, one of the nurses is calling 911 and saying, we have a patient abduction. 20 minutes later, police arrive. Male staff begin to tell the story and the hunt for Alyssa begins. Amber and Dwayne, at this point, they have driven, as Meatloaf would say, <laughs> like a bat out of hell. And they have driven miles away. The problem was this, right? This is the problem that they're now faced with. Every clinic, every hospital in the area that they're in is owned by the Mayo Clinic. So they're thinking, well, where are we going to take her? What the hell are we going to do? Because if we rock up at one of these clinics that are, you know, a Mayo, another one that's run by Mayo, they're just going to go, no, she needs to stay with us. So what the hell are they going to do? The only thing that police can do at this point is that they can track their cell phones. And they do. And they discover that Amber and Dwayne are somewhere 85 miles in the other direction from the Mayo Clinic, away from those hospitals that are all, you know, owned by the Mayo Clinic. And what they've done is they've taken a hotel room and they're hiding in this hotel room. But the... Cell phone tracking, it works. And a sheriff knocks on the hotel door. And Amber says at this point, look, it's fine. We've we've bought her a wheelchair. She's perfectly safe. You know, she's fine. Tomorrow, we're going to take her to a clinic and we're going to see what do we need to do for her care. The sheriff says, this isn't good enough. You need to go now. Take her now. We'll deal with all the thing about getting her out of the hospital. We'll deal with all that later. But for the moment, get her to a medical facility. So they go to somewhere called the Sandyford Clinic. <laughs> Sandyford Clinic made me laugh slightly because... <laughs> if you live in Glasgow, Sandyford is uh, what you would call the gum clinic here. And so they go to the Sandyford Clinic. It's fairly nearby. It's not run by the Mayo Clinic group. And they look at Elisa. And they determine that, yes, she does need ongoing care. And the family say, look, we're not disputing that. But is this care not something that we can provide at home? The Sandyford doctors say, yeah, actually, yes. This is something you could do at home. The doctors at the Sandyford, they have a massively different opinion on one major thing. They say Alyssa is absolutely capable of making her own decisions and deciding whether or not to be discharged. And so she is. She signs the forms and she goes home with her family. Finally, Alyssa is home and now it's over to Amber and Dwayne to treat her. Dwayne, as I already said, he's learned how to insert the feeding tube. The couple, they employ a speech therapist and a physiotherapist to visit their home and to treat Amber. They receive a letter. <laughs> this made me laugh. They, they receive a letter from the Mayo Clinic saying, under no circumstances, Will we ever, ever again treat a member of your family? Good. Fucking good. I'd frame that letter and put it up on a wall. I'd be like, great. <laughs> Don't bother. Don't bother treating me if this is what we've been through. Now, is that the end of the story for the Mayo Clinic? Well, no. The whole story has been played out publicly. Which is how I came to find out about it. I found out about it through Facebook. And that clinic has some defending to do. They say 
in a statement. Hospitals holding patients hostage just doesn't happen. It's all in the family's mind. Hmm. They say they stand by Alyssa not being fit enough to make decisions and that the family are placing her in grave danger. They say that they stand by each and every decision they made. Of course they fucking do. What else are they going to do? When they're challenged on this point, they're asked, well, why were you trying to get guardianship of her? And their response is, oh, it was for her safety. Her family were too interfering. They were not helping her to heal. Yeah, 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 whatever. It's interesting, there was a little article that I read about cases where doctors had to defend similar things. And the writer of the article really discusses and opens up the idea of doctors who hate to be challenged by anyone. He sort of cites moments where doctors will actually be dragged into arguments with families when they're challenged. So back home, Alyssa eventually regains her speech as best that she ever will. She's able to walk on her own and now she no longer has to use a feeding tube. Two years on, she is back at school and she's back in her clubs, no doubt wearing her cowboy boots (laughs) and spending time with her friends. She graduated high school and she was voted prom queen. This month, right now, Alyssa starts university in Minnesota. The family say that they stand by their decision to remove her 100%. The New York University School of Medicine reviewed all of the documents in Alyssa's case and said, this should never have happened. This is a cautionary tale. The Mayo Clinic refused to discuss the case any further. And so ends the story. Right then, well, that's that crazy ride of a tale. (laughs) Get in touch, let me know your thoughts, say hello, (laughs) don't be a stranger. I'm on Facebook, there's a group, there's a page, I'm on all the social medias, get me on them. If you wanted to, leave me an iTunes review, it really helps. Support me on Patreon. It really helps me keep the podcast going. Okay, thank you for listening. And I look forward to hearing every one of you and what you think about this story. All right, well, until the next episode, okay, goodbye. It didn't didn't affect me really one way or the other. I would imagine from the look on his face, let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.